Well, it's been a wet and wild and windy week in London here in the United Kingdom. Uh, but we don't worry about that right now because it's time for another episode of David Icke, The Doc Connector. And without any further ado, let's welcome David Icke. Welcome. Cheers, Rich. Now, do you know what we've not gotten into in the Doc Connecting programme, which I found incredibly fascinating and really engaging? We've not gotten into your latest book. And people think this is a shameless plug. It isn't because I want to talk about it. This is David Icke. His latest book, and this is The Perception Deception. Now, David, this is nearly a thousand pages and dozens of chapters. Um, you, you've said to me that it's the culmination of a life investigating uh, the, 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 the conspiracy and the elite and where we're all going. And there's a term that comes up constantly in the book among, among the chapters, um, and it's the term archon. Yeah. What does that mean exactly, archon? Well, First of all, I, I think you know, I, I'm coming up to 62, and that is the best thing I've done in my life. Certainly the most important contribution, I think, to exposing the world as it really is, as opposed to the one that we're told to believe in. Um, and that theme of Archon is fundamental to it, because on one level that's a reference book in the sense that it gives a detailed background of endless subjects, ancient and modern, but it's really a storybook. It's uh, a storybook that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end is, is where we are now and why we're here because of what's gone, gone before. And um, Archon is just a name, one name, that uh, is among endless names given by different cultures all over the world to a parasitic, uh, it, it, in its foundation state, um, a force without form, just energetic awareness, um, which has been manipulating human affairs for at least thousands of years and, and probably um, a lot longer. And the reason I, I, I choose the word um, archon is simply because it simplifies it. Because one of the, the points where the, um, the penny drops is when you realize that all these different names around the ancient world for gods are actually describing the same force. And it's the different names which throw people out because they think, well, that's one deity, and that's a deity, and there's another deity. Actually, they're different names of the same thing. That's a big penny drop, that is. It starts to simplify everything. And the, the name Archon comes from um, a group of people a, a pre-Christian people uh, which were called a, a, and are still called the Gnostics. Gnostics means learned and Gnosticism means knowledge. But it was a different kind of knowledge. I mean, we, we perceive knowledge as going to school and going to college and university and, your degree. and learning what yeah. they tell you. Um, the Gnostic form of knowledge was to go much deeper into a the nature of reality but but also to be able to get out beyond this reality and perceive realities that are simultaneous to, to, to this one just like radio stations share the same space without interfering each other with each other unless they're close on the dial which might be significant as we go along uh, and um, the the big breakthrough in terms of uh, the Gnostic knowledge came when a sealed jar was discovered at a place called Nag Hammadi in Egypt. It's about 70-odd uh, miles from Luxor on the Nile. And what was fantastic about this find is that you've got um, religious writings, like in the Bible, which are, which are ancient writings put between two covers. Um, but because they've been around and in the public arena for so long, They've had the potential to be changed to fit the, the authority of the day and what they wanted people to believe. Whereas these Gnostic writings, which seem to have been written about 100 AD, that kind of pe a period, and probably um, buried at Nag Hammadi about 400 uh, AD, uh, they have not clearly been tampered with because they've been underground all this time. And so you're looking at a genuine uh, reference point to what these people believed. And to, to give you an idea of their uh, capabilities and their um, awareness of 
so much. Um, they ran the Great Library at, at, uh, at Alexandria, which become known as the Great Library of Alexandria. And this was the great depository of ancient documents and scrolls. Like accumulated knowledge. Well, yeah, from, yeah, from the ancient world. Brilliant. Bringing it under uh, one roof. So you could see what, what the ancients really believed. And, and also, uh, critically, in terms of the Archon story, the experiences they had and their perceptions of these manipulative gods. And then, of course, you know, our old friend, um, the Roman Church, destroyed the Great Library and um, murdered mercilessly the, the uh, apparently it would seem genius lady, Hypatia, that, uh, that ran it. And when you think you're talking about half a million scrolls and documents in that library, and they destroyed lots of them, and I have no doubt that the ones that weren't destroyed you would find in the, the vaults of the Vatican to this very day. Because keeping from us the existence of these archontic entities, this archontic force, is crucial to keeping us under control. Because there's no better way than control, of controlling people than to have a force of control that the subjects of that control and manipulation have no idea even um, exists. So you had these, um, these, 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 shall we call them documents, uh, these uh, Gnostic documents found in the sealed jar. One fifth of them are about this Archon uh, force. They say that it is a parasitical force that feeds off human energy that has the ability to manipulate perception, hence the perception deception, and to um, create illusions which people think are real. Um, think, think the Matrix uh, movie series, for instance. And they said that these archons were in a distorted state which meant that they didn't have what they call intentionality, what I would call creative imagination. Put simply, if you gave them a blank sheet of paper and said, uh, create something, they couldn't. But you give them a, a piece of paper with something already created on it, and they can twist it and manipulate it and change it. And this word that's come up a lot in the last couple of weeks as we've chatted in various subjects, inversion. Inversion, We yeah. talked about this on the last Dot Connecting uh, program. It, they, they invert everything. That's why we live in this inverted world. So they talked of these um, archontic entities in their prime form of being just energy, but they could take form. And, you know, given what I've written over the years... It's interesting to see what the main two forms that the archons can take, according to the Gnostic writings, actually were and are. Remember, this, um, these texts were, were written around 100 AD, probably buried about 400 AD, in the wake of the, the destruction of the Great Library of um, Alexandria in, uh, in Egypt. And... The Naga Hammadi uh, Gnostic texts refer to the fact that the two main forms that the Archons take were reptilian and um, those known today as classic grey aliens. These are the two forms most described by people who claim to have been abducted by, by aliens, a word uh, I, I really don't like, um, and... Um, they're described um, in those terms. Uh, to give you the exact quote um, in terms of the greys, they said that um, the, the, the reptilian entities, and then they, they describe what we call the greys in the text, as like a unformed babies or a fetus with grey skin and dark, unmoving eyes. And if you look at a picture 
a mock-up picture of how people describe these so-called yeah. grey aliens, um, then what a great description. All that time ago, an unformed baby or fetus with grey skin and dark, unmoving eyes. And you, you start to realise that while we think that this uh, reptilian um, grey phenomenon is a, is a modern phenomenon, in fact, it's not like that at all. Um, the, um, the archons of which they are an expression in form um, operate in a different um, frequency band to us. It's very close to this one, but it's not within the frequency band that we uh, decode, which scientists call visible light. It's the only narrow uh, band of frequency that we can actually uh, perceive as, as, as the world we live in. And so... What you're looking at is a force that, from their band of frequency, has been here all along. When humans were knocking rocks together in what we call the Stone, ha uh, Stone Age and, and, and earlier, they were still in the, the state that they're in. They already had the technological knowledge, which is a big thing with these archons there, obsessed with technology, think transhumanism, by the way. Um, and, and all along, they have been manipulating human society. So in this case, um, the Gnostics were describing them, uh, what, in 100 AD. But you go back further, and they go under names like uh, gnomes and elves and goblins and in, in, our, in your country, little people. Uh, little people, yeah. yeah. Because uh, yeah. some of them are, um, especially the greys, are, are, are very small, not all of them, but, but, but there is a, a type that's very small. And so what's been happening what, through what we call human history is this force has been manipulating uh, human development. And the idea was this, and we're now living through it in, in the world that we perceive today, was to bring humans up to a point where... They had the technological knowledge to enslave themselves, which is what's happening with all this technology. Um, surveillance technology, uh, transhumanism technology, introducing technology to the body. But they didn't have the spiritual expansion of awareness to realize that that's what they were doing. And, and as you can imagine, crucial, crucial to, um, to this being successful was to keep uh, the existence of these Archon entities uh, from, from the target population. So if you look um, around the religions and around the ancient world, like I said, you can see this same force described in the same way um, descri uh, or, or called different names. So you have um, the jinn in um, Islamic belief, but not just Islamic belief in the Quran, but, but pre-Islamic belief. That's where it, it came from. And um, the jinn, um, the word jinn, comes from an Arabic root word meaning hidden, which is exactly uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, hidden because they're on a, a if you like, a, a parallel reality, close to ours, but not close enough for us to see them unless they enter our frequency range, which is when people see grey, uh, uh, quote, aliens and reptilians and, 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 and other forms. And the Christian belief um, talks about demons, demonic entities. Um, and the shaman of Central America, they have names for them like the flyers. And all around the world you see different names, but they're describing the same thing. This force, this malevolent force that possesses the human form and manipulates collectively and individually our perception of reality. Um, and it, the possession is something that goes um, as far back as, as you, can, you can go in known human history. And what is it? People talk about um, entities, like Christians talk about demons possessing the body. They don't possess the body. They connect with... Because on the level they interact with us, they're electromagnetic fields, in effect. Um, they connect with us at our electromagnetic field level, what we call the auric field. And if they can connect powerfully enough, 
they can feed perceptions, they can feed thoughts, and they can f feed um, uh, apparent uh, awareness coming from the, the, the possessed person's own mind, so they think, um, so that they are, from the hidden, controlling the person's perception and therefore um, behavior. And like I say, possession is something that you find all over the world. Uh, and, and of course, even the Roman uh, Church, Roman Catholic Church, has um, people who are official exorcists to remove demonic entities as they perceive them from people. What they're doing is removing them from that electromagnetic field, the, the auric field, which, which uh, uh, basically the, the, from which the body is projected as a hologram. So. You talked this week um, to uh, one of these um, exorcists at the Vatican. Um, was it Bruce, uh, Father, no, not, not Bruce, Vince, Father Vince Lampert. Vince Lampert, yeah. Yeah. So one of the, the questions that I found fascinating uh, uh, was what happens when you, you do an exorcism? So let's see what he had to say, and then I'll, I'll take it further. Roll the VT, Simon. Once again, if, if somebody determined, or if I determined, that an exorcism is called for, we would get permission from the, uh, the local bishop, and then once the bishop has given permission, then I would proceed with the rite, I would select the location. I always like to remind people that exorcisms are performed in a sacred space, so they're not done in somebody's house, or, you know, I always laugh and say in an abandoned house on a dead-end street <laughs> at midnight, so they're always done in a sacred space. There's a very strict protocol that's followed, the person that's possessed will be there, a family member, I will be there, and other priests and individuals that I will invite to come and to pray throughout the rite. And there is a ritual book that's utilized, so there are very specific prayers, scripture readings that are done, and then commands in the name of Jesus Christ to the demon to depart. So uh, an exorcism really is a command given to a demon to depart from its possession of a human body, recognizing that human persons are created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore demons have no claim on them. That was Father Vince Lampert talking to the Richie Allen Show last Friday. Now, I know you've got quite a bit to say about that. Yeah. We'll take a very quick break. You are watching David Icke, Dot Connector, on The People's Voice. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. And you're very welcome back to David Ike Dot Connector. Remember, if you've missed any previous episodes, go to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash the TPV channel. Now, we're talking a little bit today with David's new book, The Perception Deception. It's a terrific book, massive book, a life's work, as he said. And we're talking about archons. Now, just before the break, we saw Father Vince Lampart talking to me on the Richie Allen Show last week about how the Catholic Church goes about performing an exorcism. And it's very similar to what you've been describing in your books and in this book, in terms of pulling an entity out of um, somebody, a, an energy field, as you call it. Yeah. Uh, see, what, what confuses people, I think, is because they've got a, a religion to uh, protect and, and, and follow, they have to put these things in religious terms. So you do an exorcism and you're a Roman Catholic priest, you call in the name of Jesus and... and was interesting what Vince said about he has people around praying. What is prayer? It's concentrated, focused thought. Concentrated thought and emotional states create different frequencies. Now, these um, archontic entities are of a very low frequency because of their state of being. Your state of being dictates the frequency. If you're open-hearted and loving and um, you, you're genuine, and honest, straight, um, uh, your uh, state of being will generate a certain frequency in your energy field. If, like these archontic entities, you want to control and suppress and create suffering and feed off low vibrational uh, human emotions, so you've got to create the circumstances that generates that, i.e. the world we live in, then... Um, you're going to be of a very low uh, frequency, a very low vibrational frequency. Um, and so if you are of that frequency type, 
and you find yourself in a, a much higher uh, frequency uh, environment, you need to get out of there because you can't stay there because it's incompatible to you. And so when these the people are sitting around uh, praying, their concentrated thought, and, and Jesus is, 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 is not a, a, a person, it's the thought form. It's a way that people... Just ask people, how do you, how do you symbolize love? And they'll say, well, I, I, a heart or, 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 or the sun coming up or, or, or a candlelight or, or all these different ways that love. Christians, genuine Christians, who actually try to live the Christian life as they perceive it should be, um, they perceive love as Jesus. So by, 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 by the very fact that they're, they're saying in the name of Jesus, what they're saying is the name of their version of love. Whatever their version of love is, if they are genuinely uh, trying to invoke it, then they are generating a frequency akin to that. Um, and that is a frequency which this archontic, um, these archontic entities, this archontic energy, this archontic frequency cannot, cannot stay around in. And I would put it another way, without any mention of Jesus and without you know, any in invoking of, of this, that, the other, without any prayer as they would perceive prayer. Um, something that happened to me in Peru in um, 2012 um, one of the things to emphasize about these, um, this archontic force is it's, it's a little boy in short trousers. You know, people are terrified of demons. You know, you have demonic entities. I have control over you, you know. Oh, chill out, mate, will you? Oh, well, you when won't. you see it, though, it is pretty... No, it, it, it is. But, for but, those looking at it, it's yeah, pretty it scary. Is. You know? But it's, it, it, this is one of the great illusions that these things have power over humans. They, they have power over humans that think they have power over humans. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what, what Vince said in the interview there is, he, when he's doing these exorcism, he commands that they leave. Well, 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 you do, because you have more power than they do. And, and, and if you command it in the right way, with the right, again, energy, they, they have to get out of there. And what happened to me in, um, on a trip to Peru in, um, in 2012 was we ended up at this place at, at, on this particular day uh, at a time when it was very close to pitch darkness. And by the time it all happened, it was pitch darkness. And it was a place called the Gate of the Gods. Um, and not that far from a place called Puno um, on Lake Titicaca. And what happened was I, 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 w I was tired and, and they were going over to this Gate of the Gods through the, the rest of the group was. And I, I was tired, so I was sat on this rock and uh, minding my own business, waiting for him to come back. And uh, this Gate of the Gods, uh, and uh, why it's called the Gate of the Gods is these archontic entities in their various forms reptilian gray or their, their pure energetic form, they were the gods of the ancient world um, in, in, in so many uh, instances. Uh, they were the, the gods that, that they gave sacrifice to. You see, when um, you, you realize that these uh, gods are feeding off uh, human uh, low vibrational energy and, 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 and one of the, the lowest vibrations is terror and, and uh, uh, extreme levels of fear, well, you can understand then that when um, people are being sacrificed, they're going through, a, a, obviously, a ritual um, meant to generate maximum terror. And while the, the Satanists are, are, are in our world doing their stuff, the gods, these entities, are feeding off that very, very extreme um, frequency of terror, fear, and all that goes with sacrifice. Another thing is that um, the energy they want more than anything else, these entities, is the energy of children before puberty. Because we see puberty as a time of chemical and hormonal change. That's just a, um, an expression of an energetic change going on in the auric field. They uh, want that energy before that change takes place. And this is why throughout history we, they've talked about um, sacrificing young virgins to the gods. Young virgins is just code for children. This is where um, the story of pedophilia comes in. Why is there, increasingly clearly, 
um, such a, a concentration of pedophiles in the so-called upper echelons of society. It's because they are um, people who are deeply, deeply possessed by these entities, so deeply possessed that when the sexual act with a child is going on, these possessing entities can draw the life force, this energy, prepubescent energy, from the child and feed off it. This is why, why, why it is. I mean, why is it that, that there is this incredible concentration of paedophiles in the upper echelons of so-called upper echelons of society? This is the reason. So that's not to excuse that, of course. I know you're not excusing. No, it's very important that we say that because yeah. somebody was always excusing. You're not excusing. It. Not in, I know that. Not in the yeah. least. I've been spent the last twenty five years exposing, exposing it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but I'm, I'm just pointing out why it is. Yeah. So what happened in in um, this situation in Peru is I'm sitting on this rock, uh, and there's this Peruvian guy it's supposed to be you know looking after him, but he was sitting there doing his emails on his phone, and suddenly I heard these screams um, from the, the gate of the gods, which is also known by some there as Devil's Gate. That's interesting enough, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's gate of the gods and the devil's yeah, gate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, just very quickly, what it is, it's a, it's a sheer sheet of red rock with, with various enclaves cut out of it with, for the ritual to the gods. And um, talking to some of the locals um, after this incident, um, they were saying that if you don't come prepared to this place, you can go mad, right? This is, this is the legend. Coming prepared means you have to go there in a, in a high vibrational state, because if you don't and, and you, you, you're, you're open to uh, these entities getting into your energy field, then you do go mad. Because what happened was I'm sitting on this, this rock and I'm hearing this, 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 this like a screaming sound. And it's, to, it's pitch black. Um, and and I, I, t I said to this guy, he's doing his email, I said, look, mate, I, is there any animals here? What's that noise? And I heard it again and again. And so I, I got interested. I started walking towards the, the gate of the gods. Um, and by the way, this is all captured in a, a DVD called Return to Peru. We, we uh, ran it on the People's Voice uh, uh, over Christmas a few times. And uh, I met an American uh, a guy from the from the group. He says, "Oh, David." He said, "Don't go over there." He said, "It's horrible. The energy is horrible, evil." And uh, he said, "Oh, so and so mentioned a name. He's having a real bad experience, right?" So I said, "Well, I'm going then." So I got there, and what what had happened is a young a young fella had had gone in one of these enclaves within this gate of the gods rock, and as soon as I saw him, because I've seen this so many times all over the world, as soon as I saw him thrashing about and people thinking, what's going on, don't know what to do, I thought, something's got in him. Um, it, it was absolutely obvious to me. So um, I asked people to get him away from, from where he was, this, this, next to this rock, and he was thrashing about and shouting. And, and, and So what, what happened was we got a ring of people around it. This is all in the pitch black. Um, but someone was filming it, it seems, because it's, you know, it's what you see on the video. And, and, and I asked people to, to, to send heart energy at, at him. Love, love, just, just love, just project love at him. The moment we started doing that, the thrashing around stopped and the guy just lay, lay, lay quietly, um, not speaking. What's happening now is this entity that's got into him, in our uh, perception, it's an electromagnetic field. Um, has suddenly switched from causing that guy as much grief as possible to surviving because now the, it's, it's in this energy field that it can't survive in. And I went into, the, uh, went into the circle and I put my hands on the top of his head. Now if you look at the um, energy field of the body, you see the, the hologram, the physical body, but we have an energetic body, in fact many energetic bodies, and, and, and what interpenetrates them all is something that the, they call in, 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 the, uh, in the East chakras, wheels of light. They're vortexes, they're energy vortexes, which interpenetrate, interpenetrate uh, the different levels of, of being. And uh, there's one on the top of the head, there's one on, the, on uh, uh, what we perceive as the forehead, which is um, what we call the third eye, psychic sight. There's one here, which is communication. This here, this is the master vortex, the, the heart vortex. And then you go into the a vortex in the belly, which is about emotion. That's why um, when people get really stressed and really nervous, they tend to go to the toilet a lot. It's because it, it's affecting the, uh, the intestines uh, uh, and, um, and that area of the body, 
because of the emotional point where, where, where we feel it. I mean, we say, oh, I just love it. And you go, oh, God, I'm so, I'm so terrified. It feels so bad. And that's what we're doing in a body language. And the way these entities uh, often get in is through the one at the top of the, top of the head, uh, the vortex. They call it the crown, crown chakra. And so that's how you get them out. So I put my hands on the, um, the, the, the top of the guy's head, which is actually just my energy field, the electromagnetic field, connecting with his electromagnetic field. Nothing to do with body to body. It's, it's electromagnetic fields, auric field to auric field. And, and I, well, in words of one syllable, I mean, if you, if you look at the video, there's a lot of beeps around, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I, I told this entity it was on its way. Um, and as I did so, I felt so tangibly, incredibly tangibly, uh, a big, strong, uh, um, like, um, pins and needles uh, in my hands. I'd, I'd, I'd connected with an electromagnetic field. And it, it got more and more uh, powerful, and then I felt it go through me and out the top of my head. Um, and not, not out literally out the top of my head, out of, yeah, out of, yeah. through my crown vortex and out. And uh, uh, people you know, there will test, testify to this, and I think you can see it on the film, certainly in the, in the long version of it. The moment that happened, this fella became exactly himself again as he had not been since it started. So if you, if you look at what I've just said, and then you look at, what, to what, Vince said, yeah. at what Vince said, he's talking about it in Christian terms, because he has to, because he's got a belief system. But actually, it's the same thing. You are creating an energetic field which is not compatible with the entity's frequency, and then you are commanding it to leave. And this process has been described all over the world in culture after culture. Now, if these entities connect with you really, really powerfully, um, then you can get to the extremes of Satanism, which is what? It's interacting with these entities. In fact, I've talked to Satanists all over the world, former Satanists. Um, as they describe themselves, who are describing the rituals and, and the hierarchy of Satanism. And what they say is that the rituals are designed, I'll, I'll come to another reason for them in a second, but the rituals are designed so that the Satanist opens themselves consciously and on purpose to let these entities um, take them over. And the more powerful the um, entity is, the higher you are in the satanic hierarchy. It's based on, on, on the power of the, quote, demons that are possessing you. So in that way, you take the hierarchy, shall we say the archon hierarchy, in this uh, parallel world. And through um, possession and uh, the power of the entity dictating your point in the hierarchy of Satanism, you therefore transfer, uh, transfer the archontic hierarchy into human form. And so some of the most uh, possessed of them, uh, in other words, that their, their mental and what passes for their emotional processes are completely um, uh, dictated by these entities, they're the ones that get to the top of the banking system, that get to the top of the um, corporations, that run governments, that own the media. It's that hierarchy transported here. And um, this is a, um, a, you know, I talked about that, the, the heart chakra. The idea, uh, the only way that you can behave as they behave, pepper bombing cities of civilians, and, and mass murder in, in, in world wars, and, and, and mass murder in, with pharmaceutical uh, drugs, and, and, and cumulative mass murder with things like GM crops, and geoengineering the planet, and killing people. And it's all about death, because these archontic uh, entities feed off death. Um, closing this heart chakra, which, would, which gives us compassion, which gives us uh, integrity, which gives us caring, that, um, is essential to close down so that these possessed uh, bloodlines uh, 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 that I'm talking about um, behave in the way that is the horrific way that we see. And I came across this quote from a Swiss clairvoyant called um, Anton Steiger. 
He's not talking about reptilian entities or any of this stuff. Or the greys or anything. Nothing. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's telling his, his life story in this article. He's describing what has happened in his life and what he's seen. And uh, he's a clairvoyant, therefore he sees further into the, uh, the infinity, infinity of existence um, than just visible light, which most humans are decoding and therefore only aware of. And this is what he said, Rich. When I see people in business or politics who are particularly trapped by the material world, for example, I notice that they no longer have any light bodies at all. In other words, these other levels of um, energetic fields, which, which he's calling light bodies, he doesn't see them um, in, in, in the same way that he sees other people. That, that's part of the, the possession, the, the closing down of those fields being replaced by, by the possessing, uh, possessing entity. He says, in many of these people, the point of light at the heart chakra which is otherwise always present with humans, is no longer visible to me. Because these entities, as part of the possession, close that down. This, once that's closed down, anything goes. Abusing children, torturing children, causing mass death and destruction in wars, not a problem because you have no emotional con uh, uh, consequence for it. This would, this would be just too much to bear if you were doing that in, um, with, with, with an open heart. You couldn't bear it. Imagine us trying, to, trying to do it. You, you couldn't, couldn't do it. it yeah. But they can do it because they don't have an emotional consequence because that's closed down. He goes on. Instead of the heart chakra, I see something like a layer of shiny tar around them. This is the... the, the um, the, the very low vibrational density of, of, of the energetic um, form of the possessing entity. Instead, I see something like a layer of shiny tar around them in which a monstrous being in the shape of a lizard can be distinguished. When such people speak on television, for example, I see a crocodile shape manifesting itself around the person like a concave mirror. I don't see the light of their throat and forehead chakra and so when you you get deeper into this and and you you look at the evidence like an adult instead of a freaking child oh that david arch talking about reptiles isn't it funny when you when you're an adult instead of a child and you follow this evidence and background you start to realize how these uh, this network of families and this network of secret societies can create the absolutely stunning levels of malevolence, malevolence word, um, suffering <clears throat> and oppression that they do. That's why I say, forgive them for they know not what they do, but the entities do. Brilliant stuff. We're going to take a very quick break and when we come back we'll have the final part of this week's David Icke Dot Connector, back in a minute. And welcome back to the uh, final part of this week's David Icke Dot Connector. If you've just come in on the program and you've missed some of it, remember everything is put up on our YouTube channel. That is uh, youtube.com forward slash the TPV channel. And of course you can find episodes on David Icke. Dot com. We've been talking about archons and how some of the elite can do some of the horrible things they do and not feel the consequences of it, or not feel bad about it, or feel guilty about it. Um, it's fascinating stuff this week. Well, I mentioned just there that about um, how these um, bloodlines, which have been specifically bred as hybrids, um, so that there is an energetic um, hybrid field, part human, which is what we see, um, when we decode with invisible light, and then part non-human, um, archon in its various um, forms. Um, because <clears throat> they have this, um, this hybrid nature, there is a much closer energetic frequency compatibility between the, um, the, the, the person who is a member of these um, hybrid bloodlines and the possessing entities. So they can possess these bloodlines far more powerfully and dictate their 
uh, behavior and perceptions and lack of emotion, lack of heart, more and more powerfully, far more powerfully than they can the general population. And so, and I've used this analogy before, uh, but I think it, you know, it's simple and, and makes the point. If you um, think of scientists who, um, they can't work with the material because it's too, it's too dangerous. So what they do is to put the material in a big tank and they stand outside and they put their long gloves on and they can work inside with the tank. These archontic entities have a problem with our frequency range, incompatible with theirs, and also with our atmosphere, which is incompatible with theirs. And what they're trying to do now is change the atmosphere. We'll get, we'll get into that in, the, in, a, in a future Dot Connection show. So it's more compatible for them. But if you take the tank to be our world called visible light, uh, the human world, you take the scientists standing outside the tank to be the archontic uh, entities, and you take the, the gloves working inside to be these hybrid bloodlines, which has been specifically bred to be possessed and be vehicles for them. You've got the, the basic uh, dynamic. And I mentioned that you know, these sit atop the banking system and, and uh, the corporations and governments, and this is why they, they work, in, in, not in one country, in multi, multi, multi multiple countries. And um, this is a, a quote from a Swiss banker who was interviewed, he was interviewed anonymously for obvious reasons, in 2001. And the interview was published in the Russian magazine Noviden. This is what he said about bankers. These people are corrupt, sick in their minds, so sick they are full of vices, and those vices are kept under wraps on their orders. Some of them rape women, they're pedophiles, and many of them are into Satanism. And he said, a uh, direct quote, when you go to some banks, you see these satanistic symbols, like at the Rothschild Bank in Zurich. These people are controlled by blackmail because of the weaknesses they have. They have to follow orders or they would be exposed, they will be destroyed or even uh, killed. And they actually target people with a, um, a, a predilection, shall we say, to pedophilia and such things. Because once, once they, ha they have, and they've got evidence of it, well, the, the person does what they're told, whether in politics or whatever, um, um, from then on. But looking at this, this frequency band that these archontic entities operate in, um, it, it's what people refer to as hell. And what is hell? Hell is just a very, very low vibrational um, reality in which low vibrational entities operate um, it's like, you know, people who are deeply unpleasant, deeply malevolent, all in the same room, shut the door. Um, and, and what dictates if you're there or some, somewhere else is your frequency. If you've got a certain frequency, you gravitate to a certain frequency band. That's what you interact with. That's why people need to realize when they're being malevolent and, um, and, and treating people in, in horrific ways, that that, that, that is imp impacting upon their frequency range. And when they withdraw from the body, they are where they are, with others of the same kind of frequency band, thus what we call hell. And this is um, a, a story um, which I found fascinating because of what he, he said he, he experienced, involving an American neurosurgeon called Eben Alexander. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in 2008, um, he uh, got, uh, I think, E. coli meningitis, and for about a week, his entire brain shut down. He was, in effect, dead, except not quite. And the only part of his brain that remained active was the most primitive part that was just holding on to life. Interestingly, when people have near-death experiences, the, the mainstream of science, which doesn't know that, that from its elbow um, in terms of reality, they say, no, when people have near-death experiences, what, what's happening is um, uh, they, they are, certain parts of the brain become active and that's what, that's what it does. That just manifests as that kind of experience. Well, that part of his brain shut down, so it couldn't have happened to him. And Eben Alexander was brought up in a mainstream scientific background. His father was like that. And as a neurosurgeon, he had experiences with, with people of them dying and then uh, being revived. 
And they told him stories of near-death experiences and other realities and all, all, all that we hear. And he, he thought, he says in his book, uh, Proof of Heaven, that basically well, it's a nice story, but it can't be true because consciousness is in the brain. Well, it's not. The brain is a, is a conduit for a consciousness. It's not where consciousness comes from. Uh, consciousness is what we are. The body's just a vehicle for that consciousness to experience this frequency band we call visible light. Anyway, what happened in this seven days is he goes off and he experiences uh, a near-death experience of, of mega proportions. And the first place he describes, he calls um, the earthworm's eye view world or realm. Um, he said that uh, suddenly he found himself uh, in a place like visible darkness and he was submerged in mud yet he was also able to see through it. He had a form of awareness he said but he had no self-identity. He was just aware but he, he could remember nothing about anything except he just was there. And he calls it like I say the, the realm of the earthworms I view in the book. Um, and he said that he heard the sound of rhythmic pounding. Uh, that was distant yet strong, a little like a heartbeat, but darker and more mechanical, like the sound of metal against metal, as if a giant subterranean blacksmith is pounding an anvil somewhere off in the distance, pounding so hard that the sound vibrates through the earth or, or mud or wherever it is that you are. He said, quote, I wasn't human while I was in this place. I wasn't even animal. I was something before, below all that. I was simply a lone point of awareness in a timeless red-brown sea. And then he describes how gradually he started to form a greater self-awareness. And as he did, he started to find this place, which he didn't before, quite a scary place, as he uh, describes it. And um, he describes how reptilian, worm-like creatures crowded past him and sometimes rubbed against him with their, quote, smooth and spiky skins. Faces bubbled up and out of uh, the darkness and became ugly and threatening. The pounding intensified and became like, quote, the uh, work beat or some army of troll-like underground workers. He became aware of a smell, quote, a little like faces, a little like blood and a little like vomit, a biological smell, in other words, but of biological death, not biological life. And this is the realm of the archontic force manipulating human reality, I would most strongly suggest. And what have I been saying in our chats and in my books all these years? These entities feed off death. Anything that's dying in, in a the state of death or destruction. They feed off that energy. This is why they, they, um, they take the energy from human sacrifice. This is why you find so many satanic rituals take place in places like churchyards, graveyards, death. This is why they're destroying the planet. People say, why would they kill their own planet? They have to live on it. Well, they don't uh, uh, have the ability to manifest here, at least for very long, because this planet is up to this point still a planet of life. They feed off death. This is why they're killing the planet. This is why they're killing the ecosystem. This is why they're killing the atmosphere, to make it a place of death which uh, uh, um, is compatible with them. And he, 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 he talks about um, Ibn Alexander, about it, how he heard dull roars that changed into dim rhythmic chants, chants that were both terrifying and weirdly familiar. What I, what, what, I, what I have learned from Satanists and other, um, other sources is that when the Satanists are doing their rituals in our reality, the archontic entities in their reality, which in some ways were described uh, there by even Alexander, are doing a ritual that is compatible with the one the Satanists are doing in our world. And this dual ritual creates a, almost an energetic gateway. It, it, because the rituals are generating the same uh, frequency field, it creates a compatibility between the two during the ritual, which allows these entities to come through 
into our reality, which is how Satanists all over the world have described to me in amazing common themes how they have um, seen um, entities manifest, reptilian and other entities manifest in front of them in the, in the satanic rituals in our, in our reality. So this is the background. And as I said last week, uh, or in the last Doc Connecting show, this is why the answer to everything is to open our hearts, love each other, be kind to each other, have integrity, be, um, be loving of people that do things we don't like. Doesn't mean you don't take action to stop it, but you don't do it in hatred. Because that process of opening the heart lifts your frequency beyond anything that these entities can, can, can connect with because they're such a low vibrational frequency. And what's happened if you look at it? Humans have been pulled out of the heart into the gut. Now, that these are low vibrational emotions which they feed off. And the, um, the heart um, is something that generates love, caring, compassion, empathy. And how many people make decisions from that point of view compared with the people that make decisions on how they react to situations from the emotions? What's in it for me? Uh, and, and, and how does this affect me? And so we need to move from a gut society to a heart society. Because if you read the ancient accounts, once upon a time, we were a heart society if you go back far enough. And this archontic manipulation has made us a gut society. We need to move back. And when we do, that influence will be gone and will stop being uh, a food source energetically for that which is um, controlling us. That's the way out of this. And, you know, people who are exposing the conspiracy of intelligence agencies and military and, and all the rest of it, if you don't understand what we've just been talking about, you think the only way out of here is to stockpile weapons and to fight the enemy. You fight the enemy, you are feeding the enemy. We must love. And then the food source will be cut off, the power will be cut off, and we will live in a very, very different world. Brilliant stuff, David. Great stuff. Thank you very much for that. That comes, um, that brings us, I should say, to the end of this week's David Icke Talk Connector. If you want to read more about the perception deception, get on to davidike.com and you'll find out more about it and, in fact, where to buy it if you want to do so. We'll be back with more on the next episode. Bye for now.